Welcome to today's webinar, Trauma Verification's March Q&A web conference. By default, you have joined the audio via mic and speakers. To switch to telephone for better quality, select the telephone option on your control panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical difficulties, please send a message through your questions pane on your control panel and I will assist you. I would now like to introduce Molly Lozada, Trauma Verification Program Manager. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining um, today's web conference. Um, and I'd just like to go over some housekeeping. So we have Tammy, Morgan, myself, Julia McMurray, and Rachel um, as part of the quality staff program team. Um, again, just a couple of reminders uh, for CE. Uh, to qualify for CE, you must attend at least 50 minutes of this educational content. Uh, an email will be sent to the attendees who qualify for CE within 24 hours of the webinar, uh, ending with instructions on how to claim those. If you have any questions throughout this uh, webinar broadcast, please email us at cotvrc at facs.org. So just again, uh, just a few reminders. The goal for this webinar is to interpret the standards outlined in the resources for optimal care of the injured patient manual to ensure that hospitals have an understanding of the criteria to provide quality care to the injured patient, understand the processes and standards involved in an ACS trauma verification site visit and how following these will positively impact the quality of care at the injured patient of the injured patient at your center. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you have a copy of your resources manual, um, that's great. If you do not and have your laptop or your computer, you can go ahead and um, download a PDF copy. Um, again, um, in conjunction with the manual, you have to use the clarification document and the change log. Um, and the reason is that any changes made to any of the standards in the manual will be documented on the change log and any that um, clarifications um, for the criteria will be noted in the clarification document. So two separate documents that must be used in conjunction with the manual, and these are posted on the VRC webpage um, resources link. So I'll be sending a uh, new document out tomorrow, possibly the end of tomorrow with some updates. Uh, this is just a screenshot of what the document looks like. They're uh, a little differently, uh, but this is, uh, it does say October, but there is one from January. And again, this is the change log, and this is an Excel document. You can, you can sort this um, however you see fit, um, either by CD number or by level. Uh, what, you know, if anything new has come up, you can do it by date. Um, Again, recordings of all our webinars are posted on the ACS YouTube channel, and they're accessible through our resources web link. Um, so they're listed towards the bottom of the page. I know it's a long scroll, but they are listed at the bottom of the page, and this recording will be available within the week. All questions are pulled directly from the questions that are submitted to us through the portal. There have been no edits made to the content of that question. Uh, if your question is not answered during today's webinar, uh, that may mean that uh, I need a little bit more follow-up uh, or that um, it's a duplicate question that someone else has submitted. And I will be contacting folks here in the next week or so uh, to follow up with some questions. So just a few announcements. The next webinar is going to be scheduled for Wednesday, April 26th. Um, and the deadline to submit the questions would be April 12th. Um, we're going to try to keep our webinars consistent in the time. So we're going to keep it at 12 to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, just another uh, announcement to save the date for the TQIP annual meeting. And um, uh, it'll be November 11th through 13th in Chicago. So hopefully we'll see uh, some folks. And Julia has an announcement. There are going to be sessions on verification at the TQIP conference. So we hope you will all attend those and you'll find them useful. Yeah, thank you. That's great news. I think we're having the optimal and the topic course um, at the session. So it's a great time to, um, to attend those sessions. Um, just uh, one thing I want to announce, and I think I, I did announce this at the last 
um, call or the last webinar, we have now officially opened our uh, stakeholder stakeholder public comment website. And what this really is is uh, gearing up for our next resources revision. And I really, really want to encourage everyone to. Um, visit this website and give us some feedback on any of the criteria, whether you think it's uh, um, something we should have or something that maybe we should retire. But we really want your input on this. It's really going to help drive our process and the revision process and, and get those standards that uh, folks are uh, consistently asking for clarification or something that you want. For example, a PI coordinator, I know that's something that a lot of trauma centers want. And we just don't have a standard for that at this time. But this is your opportunity to provide us information or uh, content to do that. And the other thing I want to mention, and I'll kind of mention this throughout um, the webinar on some, some questions that, that come up frequently, is that if you are or if you want to see a change in our standards, uh, you have to provide us co um, some kind of, con you have to provide us the, the content and also support of why you want that to change. Uh, and again, I'll go ahead and give an example as we move on through this process. And uh, so I'm going to have Julia go over some scheduling reminders. Thanks, Molly. Um, unfortunately, Rachel is not able to join us as usual today, so um, I'll be uh, advancing her slides. Um, the just a few vis reminders about um, turning in your application for a site visit. So we are scheduling over a year out now. So please remember to turn in your application for your next site visit or your first site visit um, 13 to 14 months out so that we can be sure to get you in the queue. We have a limited number we can do each month. So please turn in your application early. Um, and you could go back one. So we are um, all booked up through April of next year. So we're, um, we're closing out May shortly. And um, so it's, <laughs> times are, are, are getting close. So please turn in your application. Um, so remember that when you turn in your application, um, you also have to turn in your OTL form and any alternate pathway requests. And I'll let Molly speak to those a little bit. Sure. Thank you, Julia. So just a couple of, um, again, some housekeeping rules. And um, just because um, some folks kind of forget to submit these with the application, it just makes our process a little easier for, for Anita. Um, so with the application for these level one uh, trauma centers, uh, level one pediatric adult or level one combined with a level two piece, uh, we do require an OTL form to be submitted. Um, and I do want to say that if there are, if you're working in conjunction with either an adult pediatric trauma center, I'm sorry, an adult trauma center, or vice versa with a PEAT center that utilize the same OTL, um, the orthopedic trauma leaders, that you do not need to complete the entire form in its entirety. You can just submit one. Um, and if you're unsure if we have one on file already, you can certainly reach out to Anita through the COT VRC at FACS.org, and she'll go ahead and confirm that. Um, so just a little bit more information about the orthopedic trauma leader, and it's basically what I just mentioned. Uh, for a copy of the form, it's on the um, site visit uh, packet web link that's on here. And as again, if you utilize the same OTL for the adult and the peds, we only need one form, and um, we can go ahead and confirm that if we already have one. Um, Again, the alternate pathway, if anyone is seeking an alternate pathway, I just want to clarify that the alternate pathway is for any surgeon or physician, that being emergency physician and also anesthesia now, who have trained abroad, um, they can apply for the alternate pathway. If they've trained in the U.S., or in Canada, they cannot apply for the alternate pathway. So this is primarily for foreign trained physicians and surgeons. And uh, if so, if you have someone taking trauma call, um, 
please make sure that we know that at the time. And I know it's, sometimes it's challenging because you don't find out until later on during the process. But if you do know this ahead of time, if they've not gone through the alternate pathway, so I'll back that up a minute. If they have not been approved through the alternate pathway and this is their first time, we need to have that applicant's name on the application, what specialty they're, um, they, they're in, and a copy of their curriculum vitae, so their CV. So you can send all that information to the COTVRC at FACS.org, and uh, if we need any more information, we'll go ahead and follow up with you. Uh, for those folks who have previously been approved via the alternate pathway, they are not required to repeat the process. Basically, they're just um, going to follow the same requirements and guidelines that the other trauma panel members have. Um, and you do not have to provide that information on the application. If, if you do, that's okay. We'll confirm it here in-house, uh, but you don't have to do that. Um, for PRQ purposes, if you do have someone, and I'm sorry I don't have this on the slide, uh, I'll circle back with this at the next webinar. If you do have someone who has previously been approved through the alternate pathway, in the PRQ, you will list them and you will, um, next to their name just put on there previously approved and again we can go ahead and verify that on site and speaking of the prq so once you turn in your application anita will give you your um an email receipt that we receive it and send you your logins for the prq in case you lose the link in the email you get we've listed it here so you can always refer back to the slides to find that um, and you can also access a Word version of the PRQ on our website, website in the resources section. So a little note about site visit payment. So as you may remember, centers are now billed annually for a trauma quality program, which includes both verification and TQIP. So we do not ask that you, or we ask that you do not submit payment when you submit your application. You will be billed annually. There's more info about the fee structure um, on the link there, and we have a question about it shortly, so I'll go into more detail then. Um, site visits are generally confirmed within 90 days of the requested time frame and will ideally work within your preferred time frame occasionally due to constraints. We aren't able to do that, but please know that we make every effort to schedule within the time that works for you. When you, we have a lead reviewer available and assigned to your visit, we'll contact the TPM to make sure that the dates still work for your center and then go ahead with scheduling the rest of the team. So we are now moving on to general questions. So here's the question about payment that I referenced earlier. So this center is asking, are the PRQ and payments due the same day, 30 days prior to the visit? So this is just a reminder that um, payment is no longer tied to the date of your site visit or an anniversary date or a TQIP enrollment date. All trauma quality program centers are being aligned to a July 1st invoice date. And in order to achieve that, most likely the next invoice you receive will be prorated from your anniversary date to the July 1st cycle. Um, and then once you're aligned on that July 1st, your invoice will be sent each year May 1st with a 60-day due date, hoping that you pay by July 1st. Um, so I know this is a little bit confusing. This is a short answer here. There's more uh, info on the website and we are happy to answer any of your specific questions by email or phone. Um, you can email cotvrc at facs.org, as you do for everything, and we'll get your specific questions answered. Thank you, Julia. So there's some, uh, a couple of questions about um, site visit preparedness, and um, so hopefully um, this will be helpful for some um, other trauma programs that are going um, through a site review. Um, the question had come in about whether or not, or who makes travel plans for the site reviewers and, um, you know, how do they get their information. So I'm going to assume that the question where is asking, should the organization make the travel plans for reviewers? If so, when do we get their names and information to do so? Uh, if by organization you, you are referring to the ACS, we do make the, the reviewers plans. Uh, we have a travel agent in-house that will coordinate their travel plans and provide the reviewers with a copy of their itinerary. In the event that 
you are unable to get a copy of their itinerary, you can certainly contact um, Rachel and uh, she can go ahead and obtain a copy and provide that to you. And as far as for their names, you will get that confirmed um, as an Julia mentioned about 90 days prior to your site visit, um, you know, and uh, so you'll get their name, their contact information, you can certainly reach out to them um, at that time. And I just want to stipulate that some uh, site reviewers, I would say probably a majority of site reviewers do not make their travel plans um, super early as we like them to. Um, so maybe about 30 days prior to a site visit in most cases. So just keep that in mind if you're asking for a copy of their itinerary. Um, question about case reviews. Our site visit is in April. Um, the center only had 12 deaths. Um, and I know our review agenda says 30 uh, deaths would be recommended. Uh, we realize that there's some trauma centers that do not have that many death cases. So if your trauma center only has 12 death cases during the reporting year, uh, you certainly want to pull those and have those available at the time of the site visit. Um, but if you um, have deaths that underwent um, a PIPS review outside of the reporting year, that could be either prior to the 12 months or something that just came up just, just leading up to the site visit that somehow impacted your program or your processes internally, you can certainly pull cases from those, um, that time frame. Um, that would be really nice to show the reviewers, even if it was something that was had a negative outcome but actually impacted your process and improved your process. Um, question from impl implementation of weaknesses. I think this was a great question, but uh, what is there, it, what if there is a weakness in the system that you know will be solved by, that, that you know will not be solved by the verification date? Um, not all weaknesses are required to be in place at, at um, the following site visit. Uh, the expectation is that the trauma program has recognized that that weakness is um, in the program and that there is a plan on how that's going to be addressed in the future. Same with implementation of recommendations. How do other centers manage ACS review recommendations that are outside of the Orange Book requirements? Um, for example, uh, include discharges in registry or to relocate equipment when we have never had an issue of delay? This is a great question. Um, I think it's a great question. Uh, we are providing education, so I just want to let uh, folks know that I know in the past, and, and we are doing our own internal education here for our reviewers, and in the past there were instances where um, some programs were giving recommendations or even weaknesses based on things that were outside the scope of the Orange Book. For example, as they said, relocation of equipment. Um, we know that that's not, they may not be possible. Um, an example I gave here in the slide is um, the operating room is too far from the emergency department or the hospital should have a helipad. I mean, these are huge expenses, which we know the trauma center cannot do. Um, so we are um, providing education to our reviewers to to provide recommendations and weaknesses within the scope of the Orange Book. So as long as the trauma center is tracking these recommendations, if they happen to occur recently um, through your PIPS process for issues or delays in issues or in care, um, just know that you're not going to be cited as a deficiency because these are actually outside your scope. Uh, patient inclusion, I had a question about obs observation patients. Do patients admitted in observation status count towards admit numbers? So if the patient was in observation for less than 23 hours and discharged, it will not be counted towards the total number of patients, uh, your volume requirement in the PRQ. So it's, they do not count. However, if this is something that your hospital policy states that has to be um, entered in your trauma registry, by all means, that's, that's acceptable, but it just cannot count to, to meet the volume requirement. Um, geriatric patients. Uh, our state does not include patients greater than 65 who have a ground level fall with an isolated hip fracture in our registry for ACS consult visits should these be included. Also, what about trauma activation who go home from the ER and do not meet our state registry inclusion? So let me first start off, and I think it's in the next slide, is that the hospitals a policy, admission policy, or and or the state's admission policy is going to differ 
from what we are asking uh, the center to complete in the PRQ. Um, so the admission policy for elderly patients with a single level fall or isolated hip fracture is going to be set at each individual institution. So this is based on your hospital's policy. Um, what we like to see in the PRQ is if these patients meet the NTDS uh, inclusion criteria, they should be captured in your trauma registry. And if the center includes them in the total number of trauma admissions, <clears throat> excuse me, admitted on the PRQ, then you have to follow the non-surgical. If they were admitted to a non-surgical service, then the trauma center is expected to follow the non-surgical admission process, which is uh, um, on page 121, and it is CD 5-18. So if you've got greater than 10% admitted, you want to make sure that you're reviewing those through your non-surgical process. And again, um, this is what I mentioned, that for the trauma activation, um, if those patients met the NTDS inclusion criteria, they should be captured in your registry because you want to track your trauma activations uh, for your under and over triage uh, requirement. Uh, as mentioned, this may differ from your state's inclusion criteria. Therefore, you may have to capture two sets of data points. And uh, we're sorry that that may create a little bit more work, but um, we do realize that there's some states that just um, capture different data points than that what we're asking for the PRQ. Um, question about the burn chapter. <clears throat> um, I've been seeing a lot of these questions come up recently. So the question is, in the PRQ, if we do not admit burns to our trauma service, but we have a separate burn service, do we need to answer, I'm sorry, separate burn center, not service center, do we need to answer section uh, 14? Um, there are, so the answer is yes. If the center does not admit burn patients, you're going to skip section 14 because obviously you don't admit burn patients. Or even if you transfer them out and you don't keep them, you just kind of triage them and then transfer that you don't need to answer those questions. However, if burn patients, if there are burn patients with a traumatic injury um, that you're admitting, even if they end up going to the burn center but they had a traumatic injury, you do want to include those and you can count those in your total trauma admission volume in the PRQ. Um, and I do want to uh, say that there are a few questions. I think there's five questions in the burn chapter um, related to you know, whether or not the patients are transferred and um, is there a policy or a process to, to track those patients. So again, five questions in that section. Nursing education, uh, TCRN. Um, so the question is, when will TCRN uh, be added to the extra certifications for the ED, PACU, and ICU nurses in the PRQ. So those folks that are familiar with the PRQ, we have uh, a section in each of these, in the ED, PACU, ICU, and also in pediatric, um, asking about nursing education and what certifications and things they needed. Um, and uh, we do not have a, a, a line item, if you will, per se, about TCRN, but what, what we are recommending centers to do is go ahead and add that to the other line item. And, um, and Julia has something she would like to add to this. Thank you, Molly. Um, I just wanted to add that this is a great um, uh, example of things you can add to the Orange Book Revision site. So if you think that this course is really something that we should be requiring, please go ahead and add that to that section, and we'll consider that. Great, yeah, that's a great, great input because, uh, and I just want to clarify, that's the, I know it doesn't say revision site, it says public comment site, and I know it may get a little confusing as we continue to work on it, so it's the public comment website, and again, it's, it's going to be displayed throughout uh, a couple of more slides, so that's, that's a great input there, thank you. Um, transfer of care, question, can an isolated neural trauma patients be transferred to medicine? medical ICU service after 24 hours in ICU with neurosurgery uh, following. Uh, neurosurgeon cannot admit to ICU. So I'm going to assume that this may be a closed unit. So the answer is yes. If there are no other traumatic injuries were found um, <clears throat> with the patient, um, then the care may be transferred to the neurosurgeon and the patient can be moved to the medical ICU. I think this is going to vary based on the trauma center and what the policy is for their patients. Uh, review agenda, documentation of board certification. Again, another good question about preparedness for site visits. Um, 
does proof of board certification have to be available during the site review for a level two facility? And the answer is yes. And this will be for any facility, regardless of what kind of visit you're seeking. Um, I will, not for a focus review, obviously, but for a consultation, verification, re-verification visit. Um, during the on-site visit, it is required that the hospital um, have available on-site um, your panel members CVs, copies of their CVs, their CMEs, their um, um, your policies, protocol plans, um, your um, attendance um, requirements, um, attendance sheets, if you will. Um, so the team will go ahead and review those. They usually do that on the second day. So they'll take your binders or however you have it um, situated at your trauma center. They'll take that and they'll literally review those those um, documents. So yes, it is important to have that. Uh, trauma medical director, um, the question is, does the trauma medical director have to be present during the entire ACS consultation or verification visit for level three? Again, um, for any level, and, and this does include for a focus review, for any level trauma center, it is essential that the trauma medical director is present during the site visit, during the entire process. Um, uh, performed by the ACS, and, and that really is a clear indication of the trauma medical director's commitment to the program. Obviously, if there's an emergency that happens, if there's a trauma activation that requires them to be there, um, certainly there's exceptions to this rule, but and overall, they should definitely be present for the review. Peer Q, um, question about neurological deficits. Um, how are neurological deficits defined for purposes of answering the Peer Q question in the orthopedic section? And uh, it is question 18 um, in chapter 9 um, about, there's three parts to this question. It asks for pelvic ring injuries, the all acetabular fracture patterns, and then the last question being how many of these patients had neurological deficits. I do want to clarify that that question is not applicable to this um, question 18, so we are going to remove that or really not display that in the PRQ. So for the time being, for any trauma centers undergoing a site visit in the next um, year or so, um, if this question displays on your PRQ, please skip it. Do not answer it. And uh, so just, you know, leave it blank. You don't have to put zero or NA on there. Um, is there any future plans to prioritize criterion deficiencies by data which support that they improve care for the trauma patient? Um, yes. There are current plans for the revision process to look at the current standards to determine if there is evidence-based data to support the standard. Great, great question. Again, um, this is where uh, Julianne and myself were talking about um, giving us input and visiting the stakeholder public website to provide feedback on standards. So it's, it's, it's definitely <clears throat> going to benefit a lot of trauma programs. Um, so if you go ahead and visit that and give us some feedback on things that you see that, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense or maybe you think it doesn't apply, um, but you have to, again, give us some evidence to say this is why we think it doesn't, um, it shouldn't be in place or it should be retired or maybe tweaked. I mean, I know I get a lot of questions about CME. That's one of the things that we're going to look at. That's actually one of the most important things we're going to look at um, in our revision process, but we're certainly, um, this is going to, this is open now. It's open to everyone. It's going to remain open. So we will look at those. We do look at those every single week. So any feedback you can provide us, we'll take it into consideration. So there's a couple of buttons in the PRQ that you will see, and one of them is the upload button. And um, just because uh, we're still using the same system we had with the Green Book, the 2006 uh, green Book. Uh, this was a feature that was not eliminated. So I would just ask that you um, not use that button. It's really only for office use, so um, just skip it. If there is any additional documentation that you want the site reviewers to have at the time of the site visit, or actually have prior to getting to your visit, um, just, you know, like for example, um, 
you know, um, the section about um, how many deficiencies a trauma center had or how many weaknesses a trauma center had, it's very limited. It's a 5,000 character limit. If there's, um, and I know some centers have more, some have less, but if you have more that are not able um, to fit in the 5,000 character limit or if you just want to just put on there, we'll have this in a separate document. Whatever is easy for you, we're pretty flexible in those uh, two areas. You can send that document. Once you, you mark your PRQ complete, you can send that document to Anita or myself, and what we'll do is we'll include that um, with the reviewer packet with the site reviewer, but also I would strongly recommend having that as in a separate attachment because sometimes we either get the document, the reviewers do receive it, but sometimes they don't look at it. So I would just say have it on site as well. That's truly uh, acceptable and we highly recommend having that document on site as well. Um, alcohol screening notes. Um, so a question about um, um, alcohol screening for all injured patients greater than 12 years of age, can this be part of the medical record, either yes or no, and positive or negative screen, or do we need to document a risk score? Uh, I was told this is supposed to be separate from the medical record, but it makes it challenging to track. I just want to know the standard and explanation. So um, I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, there, there should be a screening toolkit developed by the trauma center and used by the hospital. So if you develop a, a, a screening toolkit, go ahead and, and use that and, and, try and track that. Um, so it, I guess I don't know any other way to track that. If it's not in your trauma registry or in your medical case review, I don't know if other folks have uh, examples of that. And if they do, they can certainly send that to me at the COTVRC at FACS for um, suggestions, but the hospital, um, you can develop your own risk score, whatever you deem that your risk score is as part of your toolkit, and that data must be documented in, in the progress notes. I think that's the best place to document that. Uh, again, if anyone has any recommendations of where else they can track that to make it easier for this person, um, you can certainly forward that information to myself. So just a few CD-related questions. Um, question about transfers. Uh, does a trauma surgeon have to provide an assessment of the patient before transfer to a higher level of care? So there is a criteria that the ED physician has discretion to transfer the patient. However, there should be clear communication between the ED physician and the attending so they are in agreement on the care, on the plan of care for that patient. Um, we certainly don't want to delay um, transferring uh, care of the patient. So, you know, if the ambulance is waiting and they need to transfer the patient, you don't want to delay that waiting for the, the, the surgeon to come in, but there has to be clear communication between the two and all transfers are required to undergo the PIPS review process. So for more information about um, what that entails, please refer to page 33 in the resources manual under uh, the subject title, Guidelines for Transferring a Patient. Um, can there be a trauma medical director and trauma medical co-director for a level two facility? So kind of splitting the work between the TMD and the co-director, regardless of what the percentage is, the answer is no. There needs to be one dedicated um, trauma medical director um, at level one, two, and three facilities. Um, and the trauma medical director must be dedicated to that trauma center. Um, and um, and is um, I think this is in the clarification document and the change log. Um, the TMZ must be full time and, and a permanent position at your facility. So it can't just be a shared um, role. It has to be one person. Um, is it appropriate for a trauma surgeon to consult on trauma patients within 24 hours? So I had two questions on this. The second one was. Per the ACS, what is an acceptable time frame for a repeat trauma surgeon to see a level two activation? And, and it does, the, the response can be either for PEATS or, or, or the attending, the adult attending, either one. So the institution will establish the time and injury expectation for when the trauma surgeon or adult or PEATS pediatric will respond for the limited tier. So most centers, um, have a metric between two and six hours, and that's not, you know, that's not a a line in the sand, that's just a, uh, what 
some metrics are, um, and it's based on the type of injury. Um, I think the most important thing to take away from this is that whatever metric is established by the trauma center, that it's followed through the PIPs process, um, just to ensure there are no delays in care. Uh, Non-surgical patients, which standard speaks to the length of time a patient needs to be admitted to the trauma service? For example, would a patient that has one rib fracture and a hip fracture need to stay on the trauma service or a patient with a hip fracture and an ankle fracture? So again, um, defining the admission policy, the hospital would define the admission policy. Uh, so if the center, and I talked a little bit about this um, in one of the previous slides, so if the center includes the isolated foot and ankle injuries or a hip fracture and they meet uh, the NTDS inclusion criteria, they should be captured in your trauma registry. Again, there may be a difference between the state and what we want for the PRQ. If the center includes them in the total number of trauma emissions in the PRQ, in, in that one table where it asks what the total number of emissions are, then you must follow the rules for non-surgical non emissions that are listed on page 121. Um, so we're not saying you can't admit them. It's all based on your trauma admission policy at your facility. Um, and again, this may differ from your state's inclusion criteria. So you may have to capture two sets of data points, one for your state and one for the PRQ. Um, is the neurosurgeon uh, response within 30 minutes specific to the resuscitation area or inpatient as well? Uh, the neurosurgeon must be available in the trauma resuscitation area within 30 minutes of notification by the surgical trauma team. So we're looking at bedside at the resuscitation area. In a level three center, can the TMD also hold a role as a co-director or ICU? Uh, they can. So the answer is yes. So in a level one, I'm sorry, actually this is actually for um, it actually includes level one, but I know the question was primary for level three. In a level two and three trauma center, the TMD may also serve as the ICU director or co-director of the ICU. For a level one trauma center, they actually can serve uh, the role as both, and that, ha that is a new change in the clarification document. ICU coverage, can you clarify the timeliness of coverage being provided in the ICU? Does that mean arrival time or call back within 15 minutes? Um, two questions on this. Which providers are included in the ICU timely response requirement? So, so the intent is for the attending or a credentialed provider to respond, arrive at bedside, within 15 minutes for critical situations and that, is, and that it's documented. Um, any delays that impact care will, must be reviewed through the PIPS process. So the institution will credential those folks that will provide care in the ICU. So this may include your residents or your intensivist. Um, questions about the advanced practice providers. Um, patients arrive by private vehicle, seen by the EDE PA, who then activates an internal trauma alert. Does this PA have to have ATLS? Uh, great example. So the emergency department um, PAs who provide evaluation during the consult phase in, as in this example, and who are not involved in the trauma team activation are not required to be current in ATLS. So if they're not part of your trauma team activation and hands-on with the eval and resuscitation for those activations, um, those are the ones that need to be ATLS current, or current in ATLS for that matter. Um, chart abstraction, uh, this is uh, referring CD 15.6 and 15.10. What are sites doing that are being behind in chart abstractions due to the ICD-10, and what does that do to their verification visits? So, um, so if you're behind, there is a requirement, um, as you see here, CD-15-6 and 15-10. 15-6 uh, talks about that it has to be, at minimum, 80% of the cases must be entered within 60 days of discharge, so two months within uh, discharge. And um, it will impact your verification because it will be cited as a deficiency if it's behind. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about uh, why it's important that we get your feedback on that public comment website because this exactly is one of the criteria that uh, will impact or we can change or, or consider for uh, a change or, or recommendation to, to um, edit this requirement. So um, 
again, this is one of the areas that we do want your input, especially in Chapter 15, um, about um, the registry. And um, again, just provided some information. So the ICD-10, I'm hearing that it's causing some delays because it is more detailed. And there are going to be instances where the registry is going to be delayed. And unfortunately, um, the standard is what it is. There's no uh, waiver for this. Um, but we do want your honest opinion, and you know if it's causing you 50% uh, delays in your because you're capturing the ICD delays and you're doing reports and you're doing other things as the registrar, we want that information documented in the public website comments. Uh, so go ahead and visit that and give us your honest uh, uh, feedback on that. Registrar annual admission criteria, um, <clears throat> and again, this is leading to the same discussion about um, giving us feedback on that public comment site. Um, I know it's come up before as to why was the word admission included in that recommend in that criteria. And um, we've kind of gone back through some documentation and, and you know that word was left in that uh, requirement. So um, I know Tammy and I are working to um, get to a point where we can work with our chairs and get some um, clarification on this to help trauma centers with that uh, um, requirement. Uh, so again, we're encouraging all participants to visit the stakeholder public website and give us some feedback on you know on this this one and and many other requirements and how that um, can change. Uh, question on over triage, 16-7, uh, requirement for over and under triage, is the Krabari method best to use or can the facility use their own process? And the answer is yes. Uh, yes, uh, you can develop your own uh, method. It does not have to be the Krabari tool or the matrix as we refer to it. So, um, so what's printed in the book is just that it's a recommendation to use. So your trauma center, as a trauma center, you can certainly develop your own that uh, um, would monitor that and uh, and review that quarterly. Transfers within the institution. So CD 16-8, would this include patients we put in our 23? I'm going to assume that's 23 OBS. Uh, often they bridge to admit or uh, ECS, consult, pain, control. So this does not include patients who are discharged. So again, if it's 23 hours and they're discharged uh, from the ED, um, if the, you know, you don't want to counsel in your PRQ, if the patient was admitted to another service, they should have a primary review for appropriateness of transfer. So you want to go ahead and um, perform a transfer or, I'm sorry, a review of transfers. Uh, universal screening for alcohol, CD 18-3, 18-3, uh, define universal screening for alcohol use. Um, at the TQIP conference, there were three posters with very different definitions. Um, I'm sorry to say I did not see that, um, uh, those posters with the information, but I do want to clarify that for verification, uh, universal screening for alcohol must be performed on all injured patients and must be documented. And we did add a clarification in the clarification document that um, we're only looking um, for those patients that meet the NTDS registry inclusion criteria with the hospital stay of greater than 24 hours. Um, and then for the pediatric patients, the trauma center would determine or define rather uh, what age they're going to begin the screening. Um, and, and again, you know, if it's I don't know, 7, 10, 12, that is going to be determined by the facility. Injury prevention programs. What is a reasonable number of outreach injury prevention a level two should perform annually when function is covered by TPM? So um, great question because the level one is required to have a separate uh, injury prevention coordinator. Uh, so for a level two, it, it's a shared um, task by the trauma program manager. Um, we're looking for two projects related to your local issues. Um, and so the two projects on one issue or two projects on two issues. I know in the book it's written a little um, nebulous, but we clarify that as, as being two projects on one issue or two projects on two issues. So again, um, we're only asking for two during the year. Um, if there's more, that's great, but uh, we're only requiring two. 
Injury prevention, uh, a weakness in our program in our last review was a lack of injury prevention focus on our trauma, our own trauma center mechanisms or of con continued injury. If we worked in an organized trauma system, do these programs count? Um, I would say yes. So the center may collaborate with an organized trauma system. So if there's a, if you're, it doesn't have, it could be your health system, your trauma health system or, or someone or another program in your catchment area, um, but there has to at least be one injury prevention initiative uh, based on um, the injuries in your community. So um, that's CD, CD18-5. Um, in addition, the center must also track and include and track partnerships with other community organizations on its prevention activities. So again, the answer is yes. You can do a shared uh, injury prevention as long as it's, it's um, part of your PI process or, or injury prevention activities in your community. Disaster drills. Uh, chapter 20, disaster drills. Please clarify if a functional exercise would be acceptable along with a full scale. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, so you can do um, mock, or mock drills, um, and it can be either a partial exercise or full-blown, however you want to categorize that. Um, the drills must uh, they, they can be modified at your particular center and they must be conducted at least twice a year. Uh, a few questions on CME. Uh, internal education process hours. Can you be more specific to, to the new CME requirement? For example, if a neurosurgeon or surgeon want credit for reading a journal, how is that proven? How many hours would they receive? How many hours of external versus internal do they need? Um, so a lot, of, a lot of questions in this one slide. And, um, and for the person who submitted this question, I would recommend looking back at a few of the webinars that we have um, from our resources uh, website. And those CMEs are going to pretty much be at the end of the webinar. But um, there's a lot of recommendations on, on how this can be achieved. Um, so the best method to demonstrate compliance with external, um, and this could be true with internal CME, is with the course meeting certificate. So. Um, reading journals will count as part of the internal education process, and if there is a receipt of um, acknowledgement that the physician did this, you can certainly provide that um, in the binder um, during the on-site visit. And if it's external CME, um, usually there's a certificate attached to the course or the um, meeting that they're attending, and we will accept that. Um, the number of hours are based on the time required to complete any of these activities. And I think I have a slide about transcripts. Um, so for example, so here's an example. A provider produces a journal that contains an article that is associated with CME activity. 20 physicians read the article, reflect on the content, and complete questions related to that content in the article. The physician spend an hour on this activity, the provider would get one hour of CME. And I provided um, a link on here for from the ACCME on how that works. So it's, it's a great tool. I found it very helpful. So please go ahead and visit that for more information. Um, and again, for any topics and tracking examples of um, CME, please visit, um, I actually, I did put on here refer to the August Q&A webinar because I think there was a, um, an entire section on um, CME. Uh, external versus internal um, CME. Can you please clarify what can be included in, in, in an IEP versus CME tracking? If we create an IEP, do we stop collecting CMEs? So this is going to depend on the facility. Uh, for the non-surgeons, or the non-liaisons rather, I'm sorry, for the non-liaisons, if your hospital processes, process uses the internal education process uh, versus the external CME, then that certainly will suffice and meet the requirement. Um, what I did not put on here, and I apologize for that, is if your trauma center uses a mixture of internal education uh, process and CME, 
that that is acceptable, but you also have to have a summary page attached to that so that it, it's easy for the set reviewers to review that information and, and ensure that it meets the requirement. Again, for uh, topic and tracking examples, refer to the August Q&A webinar um, to, uh, link on the resources webpage. Uh, CME liver surgery. If a surgeon has CME related to general surgery, such as liver surgery, can that count towards the trauma CME? So it can, and, and it, it's all going to be dependent um, whether or not that topic on liver surgery or whatever it may be is relevant to the management of the trauma patient. So if it's a, a traumatic injury that happened and, it and, and it's about the abdominal area, absolutely that will count towards uh, the CME requirement. Uh, level three uh, CME, other than the TMD, what are the uh, what are the CME requirements for the other surgeons at a level three facility? Is it encouraged? Um, Obviously, um, any CME is encouraged at a level three. Um, the level one and twos are the only centers that we're requiring CMEs from. The level threes are not. Um, I do get this question often. So a level three trauma center, it is encouraged to have CME, but um, if your facility does not have them, it's not a requirement, and nor will the center be cited for a deficiency in meeting that requirement. Uh, specialty surgeons, are CMEs required for all call members for specialty services, specifically ortho, neuro? Uh, do CMEs uh, have to be available for review for facial trauma, um, ENT, um, OMFS, et cetera, for a level two facility? So uh, for level one and two trauma centers, the trauma medical director and liaisons for emergency medicine, orthopedic, neurosurgery, and critical care are required to obtain trauma-related CME, external trauma-related CME. For the other trauma members, uh, non-liaisons, as we refer to them, um, some people refer to them as others, um, for the above-mentioned services, um, they're required to obtain either external trauma-related or CME through an IEP process. I do want to stipulate that the um, um, OMFS, uh, plastics, um, microvascular, um, those other specialists that are listed in the resources manual, they're not required to have CME or an internal education process. It's ideal that they're part of your internal education process, but they are not required. Um, and here's the slide I was referring to about certificates and transfers. Um, could you please clarify if transcripts and, and, and generated online lists of acute CME suffice or CME certificates needed too? So um, we did, and, and I will add this to the clarification document, transcripts are acceptable. Um, however, the center must provide detail of the hours that are trauma-related. So I've seen a couple of these transcripts. They're kind of very... Um, um, they're basic, they just list the, the subject or they just list the, uh, where it was completed but not the subject. So if you're going to use a transcript, I highly, highly recommend that you provide um, um, a course outline or brochure attached to those trans transcripts so they are acceptable. Um, CMEs, um, someone asked about the 32 hours of CMEs. Um, for the board certification, recertification, can they claim those? Yeah, absolutely so. We are accepting 33 hours of CME, so we won't accept. I know some of them are like 60 hours. We're only taking 33 hours of CME that are uh, as external trauma-related CMEs, um, and you do not need to provide detail about what they did for their recertifications, but just that um, there is documentation that they did do their um, research and uh, boards, and we will accept 33 hours. And that concludes our webinar for today, and I want to thank everyone for participating. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email us at the COTVRC at FACS.org. Thank you. Thank you, Trauma Verification staff, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Trauma Verification's March Q&A Web Conference. If you have any other questions, please contact COTVRC at FACS.org. On behalf of the Trauma Verification and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.